You're listening to the For Climate Tech series on the Forward Faster podcast, providing bite-sized insights for climate tech innovators. Hello, and welcome to For Climate Tech's podcast, powered by Forward Faster. I'm Chris Carpenter, Marketing and Community Specialist with For Climate Tech. With me today is Zoe Wells, the newest addition to the Venture for Climate Tech team as the program manager. Uh, she was founder and CEO of Drover, an ag tech company transforming livestock management to be more profitable and regenerative through revolutionary IoT technologies. Uh, her background is environmental engineering as well. So welcome, Zoe. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're glad we can uh, finally get a chance to sit on and start meeting members of our team, um, especially as I know uh, recruiting is picking up. So to start, it off, start us off, so can you um, walk us through how you came about to the venture team and how you can kind of made your way here? Yeah, absolutely. I've always wanted to work in climate tech, whether as a founder or on the venture side. I discovered Venture for Climate Tech and kind of immediately knew it was the perfect opportunity because of the sheer value it brings to early stage founders that I really haven't seen elsewhere. Um, as you mentioned, my role is program manager. So I'm responsible for sourcing companies globally, running our boot camp, managing our mentor network, executing our curriculum, and working hands on with founders throughout the program. Nice. This is nice. And obviously your experience as a founder before with, um, Dro and it, is Drover pronouncing it correctly? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of, how, I mean, I know that was like one of your, immediately after school starting that, I mean, how does one fall right into starting a company? I feel like that's no easy feat to do, especially kind of like starting off. That's not usually the thing you see at the top of the resume. Yeah, yeah. Well, while finishing my undergrad at CU, I became more and more interested in leveraging entrepreneurship to build social and environmental justice. And actually, before starting Drover, I was working on another idea in the wastewater space. But I distinctively remember waking up one day and seeing an article by Bill Gates on the massive impact agriculture, especially livestock, have on climate change. And around that same time, I met a farmer who was practicing regenerative grazing with his animals. Um, I, I went and I toured his farm and he walked me through this really simple yet effective way. He was restoring his land, raising animals humanely and putting carbon back in the soil. And so I asked him, why aren't more people doing this? It seems like a no brainer. And he really explained to me the, the limiting factors. One of the biggest ones being fencing. So, to practice regenerative grazing, you have to move the animals frequently, even in some cases, multiple times a day. So you need a fence that can move with them. And the industry standard for the past like 60 years has been cheap electric fencing that breaks easily and shorts out all the time. So that day he became my co-founder. Him and I set out to build a smarter fence, which could be controlled from a farmer's phone. And so by adding remote control, short detection, and voltage monitoring, we save the average farmer 14 hours a week in setup, increase their productivity and thus profit, and really remove the barriers preventing many small livestock farms from adopting regenerative grazing and putting carbon back in the soil. Wow. And I wish I could get 14 hours back in my week. Right. Um, so that's, that's awesome to hear. Um, and obviously, you know, with your current role as program manager, they're so lucky to have you because, you know, your experience as a founder and going through some of these common hurdles that I, I think a lot of other founders will experience. Um, what are some of those lessons that you took from Drover that, yeah, that you will be implementing in the, uh, the programming for Venture for Climate Tech? There are so many. I'd say the biggest lesson I'm excited to bring forward is in truly understanding your customer and not over-engineering. As a founder, there's a lot of things you're focused on at one time, but at the end of the day, you need to make your customer your biggest priority. Um, my team and I spent over 152 hours touring small farms and understanding the exact need of our customers. And that's really what allowed us to make a good product. At the same time, I wish I would have actioned our learnings faster than we did. So engineers have a tendency to over-engineer and I really want to encourage the founders in our cohort to iterate as quickly as possible and focus on one key feature. 
Fantastic. And as we're talking about the cohorts and people coming in, I know you all have been buried and wrapping up recruitment period for Venture for Climate Tech. Is that right? Yes. yes How are absolutely. you holding up? And uh, are you able to give us an update on that, the status of that? Totally. We're holding up just fine. It's actually been super exciting, a little overwhelming, but there's a lot of good energy behind it. Uh, we've been blown away by the many incredible applications we've received. Uh, not only do they represent the many industries climate tech includes, but they also came from all across the globe. So reviewing the applications has really made me so hopeful for the future of our planet and also just so impressed by how creative founders are. Yeah, that's super cool. Do you know, as you're kind of sifting through those, um, what have been some of those key qualities um, that you think make, make founders stand out and will help them be successful? Yeah, um, bottom of the line, it's coachability, in my opinion. I truly believe many aspects of building a successful company can be taught as long as the founder is coachable and truly passionate about the problem that they are solving. The passion piece is critical because entrepreneurship is really hard. And if you don't truly, truly care about the problem you're solving, it's really tough to have the grit and to get through the lows. You really want to be able to learn and fail along the way. So definitely the biggest thing I'm looking at in all of the applications is, is the founder coachable and are these people we're really excited to work with. Wow. Yeah, I'm sure going through being an entrepreneur and a founder is a humbling experience to say the least, <laughs> to figure out and fail and learn from that. Um, and as you're kind of, you kind of referenced the grit of entrepreneurship and and starting your own idea and getting it off the ground. Um, and I feel like so many times, especially, I mean, even on this own podcast, we highlight so many wins and successes of being your own company and um, what's exciting, what's new. Um, but I'm always interested to hear too of like, what are those fails that just suck? Like you just really flopped and, and wasn't sure if that's information that, um, that every new founder is aware of. So are, do you have any examples or thoughts on um, some of the less glamorous parts of entrepreneurship or even yeah. in your own experience with, with Drover? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of not so glamorous parts. Um, you're working harder than you have ever uh, with often no income and it can be really lonely. There's truly so much riding on your shoulders. You're supporting a team you now have these incredible customers that you don't want to let down and you have to figure out how to pay your rent. On top of that, it'll likely be years until you really see the hard work you're putting in pay off. So it requires a lot of patience. And I think my, my first kind of failures around being an entrepreneur is I expected everything to happen so much faster than it did. And I, especially when talking to customers and when engineering, um, I really wish I had spent more time there and just had the patience to stick things out and to, to really understand the problem. And so those were my biggest failures. And again, those are things that I really want to highlight with the cohort, cohort and help with. It's awesome. They're very lucky to have you all. Cause yeah, I can't, I can't even imagine going through all this. Um, and kind of now on the flip end, the more positive part, um, you know, as you've been sifting through these applications, what, and you don't have to be super specific because I know that we haven't, there's no official announcement yet, um, but what's some of the, the more exciting solutions in climate tech that you're seeing um, that, that make you hopeful? I mean, I feel like there's been so much um, doom and gloom about our situation and uh, I think highlighting too some of those, those companies that are out there is, is important to recognize. Yeah, yeah, it is. Obviously, I love ag tech. I've always been really drawn to simple solutions that mimic and replicate nature. So those are my favorite, but because of all this time we've been sifting through applications and looking at new technologies, I've also been intrigued by the hard tech solutions. Lately, I've been really interested in new battery technologies. So lithium ion obviously isn't sustainable. And I think based on what I'm seeing in the market right now, we're really on our way to developing new battery solutions. I've also been really blown away by the companies leveraging IoT and AI. 
uh, to optimize construction, manufacturing, supply chain, you name it. There's so much room for innovation there. Um, and really at the end of the day, we need all solutions. So to be honest, I've been really excited about all of them. That's cool. Yeah, I always, I always love the analogy of there's no silver bullet, but it's more of like a climate bird shot, just a hundred, a bunch of little solutions that we need being yeah. shot out there. Um, very cool. So, uh, and part of, part of the podcast here is, is we like to fast forward 10 years. Um, and it's a two part question. So I'll kind of give you a spot. Oh, I'll give you a beat in between. Okay. Um, fast forward 10 years. How do you think the climate tech landscape has changed? Um, and who do you think will be some of the key players? And by who it can be like this industry or this company or even these people, whatever, uh, whatever level of detail you feel comfortable getting into. Yeah, that's a tough question, but one that I'm really excited to think about. I mean, clearly climate tech has grown so much even in just this past year. I think more and more people, including investors and in our government, are waking up to the importance of these solutions. And so I think we're going to start seeing more money and resources poured into it. I, I think the big players, I imagine that 10 years from now, Breakthrough Energy Partners and Koshla are still going to be big players in the industry. But I bet we also see investors who haven't traditionally been in the space start investing in it more. Um, we've also seen massive corporations commit to being carbon neutral by 2030, but I think we'll see even more and more step up and commit to being carbon negative by 2030, at least I hope. <laughs> yes, huge emphasis on the hope because we need it. Yes. Um, and the last part of this question is where do you think you, uh, or where do you hope to be in, in the climate tech space in the next 10 years? Yeah, um, I am still figuring that out. The reason I'm so excited about this current role is because I've always dreamt of having my own climate tech fund. And I'm really looking forward to being a champion for these companies, connecting them to the right resources, mentors, and investors. So perhaps as I get more and more experience, I can manage my own fund someday. Uh, but part of me also sees myself being a founder again. So we'll see. The best part about this, uh like this industry that is constantly changing. Um, exactly. So very cool. Well, Zoe, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and thank you all for listening. Uh, we'll see you next time. If you want to follow our podcast series and see more of our work, uh, please go to forclimatetech.org. Uh, that's F-O-R climatetech.org. Thank you for listening and we'll see you all next time. Mm -hmm.